Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Jason Belden with the CAF Disaster Preparedness Office. We'll get started on the webinar in just a few minutes. We're going to let people get logged in, uh, and then we'll be right back with you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to part three of the CAF Disaster Preparedness, uh, Emergency Preparedness Rule um, webinar series. Uh, this one's Get to Know Your Policies and Procedures. Um, we want to welcome all you guys for, for uh, tuning in today. Uh, and just a quick reminder that our first two webinars uh, that we have recorded are both up on YouTube. So if you've missed those, you're feel uh, feel free uh, to go back and watch them and listen to them at any time. Um, and then this one should be up on YouTube fairly shortly after the presentation ends. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Courtney Kesterson, Disaster Preparedness Program Coordinator, who's going to take you through the first portion of the presentation. Right. Uh, good morning, everybody. So we kind of skipped over introductions, but that was Jason Belden, our Disaster Preparedness Program Manager, and I'm the coordinator for the program here at CAF. Uh, part three, getting to know your policies and procedures. Um, so Jason, like Jason said, we have part one and two available, but today we're going to be covering uh, policies and procedures. And a lot of what we're, well, everything that we talk about today is going to be based on your hazard vulnerability assessment, which we covered in part one, if you need to go back and take another look at that. Um, so, but for those of us for that have already gone through the series, this might look familiar to you. So a lot of the policies that we are going to talk about today are going to refer directly back to this document here. So you'll need to be checking your scores and your top three year to five hazards throughout this entire process. Um, so CMS in the new emergency preparedness rule that they released last year, they made it very specific. Uh, clear that they're looking for more formal documentation of what your plans are for an, uh, an emergency. So some of you before may have been using operating guidelines for what you would do in an emergency and CMS is saying that's not really going to cut it anymore. You need to have these formal documents um, known as policies and then your operating guidelines or procedures would fall under that. Um, so it's considered more formal. Um, they're looking for certain elements that would um, guide you through an actual event. So uh, at many times we refer to uh, the CAF uh, Emergency Operations Plan template. And we just want everybody to know uh, 
that we designed that prior to the implementation of this uh, the CMS rule. So there were things in there that we had listed uh, that were best practices that are now currently going to be minimal requirements with the regulations. But there are some things in there that we did not include. And I want you guys to know that we're redoing the uh, emergency operations plan template. So uh, please stay, stay tuned for that. We hope to have it done by the end of October. Uh, it's a lot to rewrite the entire thing. Um, and in the template we have now, our policies that we have written out are probably not sufficient enough to meet the new rule. Uh, they need some customization. Uh, so as you, if you're going to use the template that we designed, the procedures portions of it are very good. There may be some small things that we need to add to it, but it's the policies that we really need to rewrite. So we're working on that now. Uh, we're going to do it in a way that if you adopt our emergency operations plan template and you use those procedures, uh, by us redoing the policies doesn't mean you'll have to change the procedures portion of it. So I just want you guys uh, to know that, um, uh, you know, we're working on a fix for you guys and we hope to have that uh, before the rule takes effect. So. Right. Um, so Jason is referring to one of the handouts that is attached to this webinar uh, module. And also I attached it to an email that I sent out to to the registrated the registration list. Um, so the emergency operations plan template, it does need to be updated, but all of those checklists and procedures you'll find in there will still be um, perfectly good to use. And then you can use those policies in there and, and add to them. And we'll go over some of the elements that CMS is looking for in your policies in just a second. Um, some of the other handouts that we have today are, of course, the PowerPoint slides, um, your evaluation for your continuing edu education credit. Um, we also have a checklist for you to evaluate your own EOP. And then there is a sample um, memorandum of understanding. And we're going to go into detail later on about that. Um, so what are the differences between a policy and a procedure? So the policy is a formal document that lists the rules and framework for the task. Um, and then a procedure is more like a checklist or an exact instructions. And so kind of the difference in purpose of these is a policy can have more like all hazards elements in there as opposed to some of your procedures. So if we take a look at the next slide, this is an example of a policy for shelter in place. And um, we don't need to read the entire thing right now, but I'm just going to point out some elements in here that make this more customized and to give you some ideas of how you can edit the policies already in our template and make them fit your facility's unique needs because we keep coming back to those unique needs and that's really what CMS is looking for throughout all of these um, new regulations. So we've got some arrows here that point out some elements um, based on our risk assessment. That's definitely something that you'll want to refer to because we need to keep coming back to that, your um, top three to five hazards. And then also that other arrow pointing out that you have a an emergency plan for part of this issue that you need to address in your policy. So that would be kind of like referring to a procedure, but as you can see, it's part of a larger um, initiative or this policy that you will be developing. And then another point in here that I thought was pretty good is the second paragraph. Uh, in the absence of a mandate from local authorities. So this would go back to how are you going to actually activate your emergency operations plan. Um, I recommend having very clear steps and instructions on recognizing when something is beginning to interrupt your operations and when you want to actually start using these policies and procedures because if you kind of wait too late, you might be wasting valuable time. Um, having those predetermined will actually save you a lot of headaches, a lot of time. And then lastly, um, this section down here goes back to that all hazards approach. So having a policy for shelter in place, um, you might need to shelter in place for more than one type of event, right? So having kind of a little uh, section in here saying what this would apply to would also help satisfy what CMS is looking for.
Yeah, so that's a, that's a great point that Courtney's making. The policies will be based on an all hazard uh, risk assessment, but the individual procedures within your emergency operations plan will have a checklist for each one of the type of events that could occur. Uh, uh, a good example would be there's a facility in Los Angeles now, Shelter Cove, I think is the name of them, uh, who ended up having to shelter in place during the Latuna fire. So that's an example of a wildfire um, uh, causing that shelter in place. But there are a number of other things, and that's what, where the procedures would differ based on the type of event. So. Um, so we showed you an example of a policy. Here are some examples of those procedures that would fall underneath it. And as you can see, it's a lot more step-by-step -step and customized to the kind of incident. But um, the policy itself will be outlining those core functions that your staff or your building would be able to um, be able to perform in, it in more than one kind of emergency. Yeah, and those, uh, those two um, slides that you see on the screen, uh, the one on the left is from the Emergency Operations Plan template. The one on the right is from the Nursing Home Incident Command uh, Incident Response Guides. So those are response guides within NICS that will uh, give your folks um, uh, kind of direction on what to do in, in the event of an incident in, both, in time increments. So like a immediate risk, intermediate uh, time frame, and then extended time frames. So. Um, so the next part of updating your policies and procedures, uh, you should have some kind of log in there to show that you are reviewing and updating them annually. So you'll want some kind of spreadsheet showing, uh, listing each of your policies and then maybe a column for when you last reviewed and updated it. And that would be for surveyors. Um, but these are the specific policies that CMS has called out in the regulations that you need to update uh, annually. So subsistence needs, you'll definitely need to check at least once a year if all of your emergency food and water is still good. Um, that makes sense. And then alternate sources of energy. Um, Jason will go into detail about that more. Um, shelter in place, medical records, um, any agreements you might have with volunteers, relocation sites, and um, what a facility's role would be during an area-wide disaster. For that, I'd recommend contacting your county and seeing what they expect from you, because each county is a little bit different. Yeah, and um, and of course, evacuation. We're going to talk about all of these uh, requirements um, uh, throughout the webinar. So. Um, another one that's specifically called out for skilled nursing facilities in the regulation is uh, addressing missing residents. So having a procedure or operating guidelines for this is not uh, sufficient anymore. You need to have one of those formal policy documents um, because you can have missing residents in different kind of emergencies if you're evacuating, if there's a wildfire, if, um, just on a regular day someone yeah. Goes missing. Yeah, and this is for obviously for folks, uh, for wanderers and stuff like that. This applies to both skilled nursing and intermediate care facilities. So those two types of healthcare provider types are the only folks that have to do this. So if you're one of the other healthcare provider types, you don't have to have a policy for that. But for all skilled nursing facilities and all intermediate care facilities, you need a policy and procedure for missing residents. So. Um, um, so next we have subsistence needs. Uh, CMS has not said specifically you must have three days of this. They've given you some leeway on that, um, but that's because you'll need to refer back to your hazard vulnerability assessment. So it's pretty standard to say you'll have three days of food and water, but what if you're out in the desert? What if you are somewhere super remote and you've identified that if there's an area-wide disaster, it might take emergency responders a couple extra days to get to you. Um, analyzing your risks and taking that into account and saying, hey, maybe we need five days of food and water. Um, that can really make all the difference. And that is something that you need to include in your policy as well. Um, so the subsistence needs, that goes for shelter in place and evacuation. Um, 
And it also talks about that the provisions need to be stored in an area which is less likely to be affected by uh, the disaster. So even though CMS is saying we're not going to dictate what your individual choice is for food and water, we just need to make sure that you have enough provisions uh, that that apply for the plan that you have. So if your plan is to shelter in place for three days and then get resupplied after three days or evacuate if need be, then you need to make sure that you have the subsistence needs that meet that time. And now CMS has not dictated that you need to have um, uh, food, water, and medical supplies for people that show up in their facility, in your facility, but they have suggested that you should consider that. So not only uh, food, water, and medical supplies for your residents and staff, so that's uh, both, both those folks, but also for anybody that you expect may show up during an event. So if you're a part of your plan is to have your staff bring their families with them in the event where you want them to work, uh, then you need to make sure that you have those supplies on hand as well. Uh, so that's that's important to, to note that CMS hasn't required that, but they said that you should consider that. So uh, that leaves a lot of leeway for the surveyors. My recommendation is that you uh, factor have, that in in your policies. Yeah, have a very detailed policy for that. And also, um, just sort of like a quick best practice, I've heard that people um, assign a monitor a specific person whose job it is to track how much food and water is consumed because you might plan for three days but you might also power through your water and if you don't have some kind of log or person aware of that um, yeah and and the folks in uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, that were affected by this um, we had um, we spoke with one of the providers who said they had seven days worth of water planned up and because nobody was there to oversee the distribution of the water, they went through seven days of water in like two days. So it can happen. So if, you're, uh, if your plan is to, let's say, have three days of, of water, one gallon of water per person per day, which is the minimum recommendation, then uh, you want to make sure that you're not handing out more than that because in reality, that three-day water supply wouldn't last you very long. So. Um, and this, these survey procedures are what the surveyors will be looking at. This is what they're going to look at in your plan. This is what they're going to be asking you when they get to the facility. So they're going to verify your emergency plan has policies and procedures for those subsistence needs. Um, they're going to verify your emergency plan has uh, policies and procedures to ensure alternate energy sources. And we'll, we'll, we'll expand on that at length in a second here. And then we'll also need to make sure they'll verify that your plans and or policies and procedures provide for sewage and waste disposal. So um, we'll talk about the what, what do they mean by alternate sources of energy? Because this was something that we were all very concerned with when the rule first came out. Um, we all assumed that they meant um, the expansion of our existing emergency power systems to include um, all of these things where we would have to wire up our HVAC systems to our emergency power to make sure that we can maintain a safe temperature. Um, luckily, uh, CMS had enough feedback from different states saying that this would represent an extremely high uh, cost and, um, and it would be an unfunded mandate that we'd have to uh, pay for. So they've basically backed off the requirement that uh, emergency power or these alternate sources of energy have to come from an emergency generator. Uh, what they have said is that you can use other methods to meet this and whether that is a method that's uh, uh, built in into your physical plant, meaning you could hardwire your HVAC into your generators and that would be a compliant system, or you could uh, plan to have a, a temporary generator uh, brought to your facility. You could have a plan to have temporary air conditioners brought to your facility. The Just want to make sure that when you make those plans that they're realistic. Um, this may not be something that the surveyors are looking for, but it's something that we have learned uh, through this last summer 
during the heat wave when we had multiple facilities with HVAC units that failed, uh, there are a finite number of emergency uh, coolers that are, can go around. So, um, so you may have a contract with somebody that says they're going to bring you um, emergency cooling or cooling equipment uh, that can be connected to the building, but they also are the county's um, uh, contract, and they have a contract with 14 other providers. The reason why I say that is, is if there's a wide disaster, you want to make sure those resources are going to be there for you. They're not something that's shared with a bunch of other providers. And if that's the case, then maybe you think about doing something in-house, uh, buying, purchasing temporary air conditioners. And in an event where your heat rises, if you can control the temperature in one or multiple rooms, you can move residents to that room rather than having to cool the whole facility you can keep a portion of the facility cooled and that is okay as far as the rule goes so um, the other uh, bullet points the emergency lighting the fire detection extinguishing and alarm systems those should be covered uh, already under your emergency power now and if they're not they should be battery powered so most of the time in 99% of the facilities, those things will be already uh, uh, compliant. And the sewage and waste disposal is the last thing. And we'll talk about that uh, at length in a second. Did you, have, did you want to add something to that? Oh, I just thought you made a good point about not counting on those contracts with resupply vendors, because if the disaster is large enough, the county will just commandeer resources and probably reroute them to like hospitals. Um, so I wouldn't count on that too much, but for smaller ones, smaller yeah. incidents. And the, all the requirements that you're looking at now are all required of acute care facilities. So uh, they're all going to be, uh, you know, dealing with the same kind of thing. And so they may be looking to, um, to um, supplement their existing systems with these temporary systems so that could affect your ability to uh, obtain those in the event of an emergency or a disaster so um, so uh, these are just quotes from CMS from their comment period um, uh, it, that gives a lot of flexibility to that so uh, and then we'll talk about the life safety code requirements because there are some um, but they should be similar um, to what you're already uh, doing here. So, um, and this is the uh, quote from CMS that says the long-term care facility is allowed to um, relocate folks within a facility rather than evacuate as long as you can maintain temperatures in that specific facility. So, uh, or that portion of the facility. So let's say you wanted to move folks to your dining room or to your activities room because you, you have uh, red plugs in there and you can connect them. Uh, temporary um, air conditioners or those portable air conditioners in there, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, that is allowable uh, per this rule. So um, now another portion of the rule that could be uh, a little more difficult to meet, but um, just to keep in mind, you may need to make sure that in your policy that you have a provision uh, for how you're going to provide uh, sanitary storage of your provision. So that means uh, food and water, uh, your emergency food and water water supply. If um, if the food you have is temperature sensitive, you need to make sure that it's in a uh, climate controlled environment uh, and medications. A lot of medications are temperature sensitive, so you need to make sure that wherever they're stored um, is not um, subject to extreme heat that could damage it or extreme cold although we don't get too much extreme cold in California. but uh, And now I want to make this clear. For those of you that are intermediate care providers, um, uh, ICFs, these requirements are um, don't apply in the same way that they do for skilled nursing facilities, but you do have to have a plan to provide for all of these services. And it may be in your instance if your air conditioner goes out and you don't have a temporary system, then you would just move straight to evacuation. So uh, that's up to you. It, they, there's a lot of uh, room for you to develop a, a plan or policies and procedures that will meet your needs uh, uh, or is flexible enough to meet the needs of the regulation. So, um, 
Now, for sewage and waste disposal, um, they did say if you have uh, some kind of electronic pump that pumps water into or out of the building, that needs to be connected to an alternate source of energy because that's important that uh, the water gets into and just as important gets out of the building. Now, if your water uh, for some reason becomes unusable or you're no longer allowed, uh, able to flush the toilets or do gray water down a sink, um, you're gonna have to have a plan to, to deal with the, the waste from residents and staff um, when, it, when it comes to a disaster where you lose uh, water. So um, whether that's uh, having garbage bags that you can place over the toilets, but you need to make sure that you, you know, have a spot to dispose of this biohazard material, um, uh, you know, contracts with uh, transportation companies to dispose of that, you know, stuff like that. Um, you also need to make sure that you have access to medical gases so they can't be uh, in the, uh, in the way of the, you know, the uh, disaster or emergency, you need to be able to have access to them. Um, and you need to be able to pro provide treatment of soiled linens, uh, whether that's a contract with somebody that would come pick it up if you lost power or lost water or something like that. So um, there's, uh, now this is on, this is different than the uh, alternate sources of energy, but this is another new requirement. Uh, the requirement requires tracking of evacuated residents and on-duty staff. So um, now there we have a generic form or a template form that you can use uh, from the Nursing Home Incident Command um, uh, evacuation tracking sheet. And it just allows you to be able to track where these folks go. Now there's no CMS requirement of what kind of format you need to use in order to track your residents when they're evacuated, but you do need to have that um, written down and expect the surveyors to ask to see what your plan is to track residents uh, in the event of an evacuation. So, so they're going to ask to see what that system looks like and, um, and verify that it's part of your uh, policies and procedures. So, and um, just a little, a little note: the tracking of evacuate, evacuated residents. That's very important to keep uh, records of because that has implications for reimbursement later on in the recovery phase of your facility um, after a disaster. And we'll go a little bit more into detail about that later. For sure, for sure. And if you can think about it in these terms, uh, if you think about it in the terms of Hurricane Harvey right now, they had. 40 something facilities evacuated during that time. Can you imagine trying to track all of the residents uh, from one central point uh, to wherever they went? It's very difficult. So there's no way for uh, a government entity to be able to perform that function. They're just not set up to do it. And that's why they're asking people to do it on their own so that they can provide that information uh, to, to the county. So. Um, very important. So Courtney is going to go over safe evacuation because this is a new policy and procedure that's required. Right. So this uh, policy right here, it's pretty dense. This is a, a one day training just on safe evacuation that we've done before. So um, if you have any questions about any of this, we will definitely get to them in that last chunk of time that we have. But um, so let's go ahead and jump in here. So the, the policy for safe evacuation, the issues you will need to address are the uh, continuity of care for your evacuees and their treatment, um, sending all of the necessary things with them like DME, um, pharmaceuticals, special food they might need, um, personal items maybe, hearing aids, all that good stuff. Uh, it needs to, your policy needs to address staff responsibilities in an evacuation because as the name might imply, you might only have a couple hours, four hours to try and get all these people out. So having those responsibilities ahead of time saves you time. Uh, transportation, that is usually one of the hardest things to do for evacuation. Having a location uh, for them to go to and then also um, primary and alternate means of communication. Yeah, so these are all of the things that need to be in the policy. Um, they need to deal with that. So um, the transportation and evacuations, uh, 
those are things that you'll need to coordinate with your uh, local emergency response partners, and we'll talk about that at length. In the evacuation location, so we need to, so you guys understand, if you plan on getting uh, reimbursed or you plan on continuing to bill, we'll talk about this in a second, but those are really important for you to pre-identify that stuff, and that's where that MOU is going to come into, into place. Yeah. Right. So your policy, you'll want to address working with the county to identify um, where these people are going to be going, how they're going to get there, and how you're going to be communicating all this information. So we will jump into the first kind of subsection here. And come on now. There it is. So the continuity of care for your evacuees. Um, so this chart here in the bottom half of the screen, this is a breakdown of a study done by Brown University and uh, the University of Southern Florida on what the morbidity rates for evacuees after these large hurricanes or tropical storms. So you can see that um, uh, evacuating the population you find in skilled nursing facilities, they're elderly, they're fragile. Um, these traumatic events have a very real, very measurable uh, outcome on their length and their quality of life. So doing um, evacuations properly and making sure that they have everything they need and that they're going to a place where they'll be cared for properly, um, not only does that have an implication on their life, but if if these people don't come back to your facility, that has implications on your continuity of operations and uh, your recovery phase as well. Yeah, and uh, I'll go beyond that. Obviously, we know these large events, these catastrophes that are huge, are going to have really negative outcomes. Specifically for skilled nursing residents, uh, we tend to be more at risk. But I, I will say this is not just a large scale disaster thing. We have seen uh, really, um, really significant negative outcomes from smaller events, whether it's just one facility. There's a facility that comes to mind in Texas that was ne next to the fertilizer plant explosion. I, I believe it was Waco, Texas. Huge explosion, killed a bunch of firefighters. Uh, there was a nursing home next to the uh, next to Arkema. the yeah, the plant that um, had to be evacuated. Um, they had a significant number of negative outcomes. And that was something that was just for that one facility. So it doesn't um, it doesn't matter if if um, if this is what prompted CMS uh, to, in my opinion, was the number one thing that they said this causes the problem because people in nursing homes die. Uh, much sooner than they should normally uh, pass away uh, in the event of a disaster. And that's why we need to have the skilled nursing facilities in here. So the number one thing, obviously, is to make sure that your folks are taken care of from the time they leave your uh, facility to, to making sure wherever they're going can provide them the same level of services uh, and there's no interruption from point A to point B. So. Even beyond that, too, if you end up sending staff with them to help at the, the receiving facility, too. Yeah. Um, so when you go to evacuate and you are identifying all of the different levels of care that your, your residents need, um, in a short period of time, how do you decide who goes first, who gets what resources? Um, so having some kind of procedure or policy for triaging patients, um, keeping track on maybe a, a monthly or even weekly basis of which patients or residents need wheelchairs, which ones are non-ambulatory, um, bariatric, having all of that information uh, refreshed on a monthly basis will put you hours ahead in the game when you come down to an evacuation like this. Yeah, and, and, the, and when they, in the rule, when you look in the interpretive guidance from CMS, uh, they have not given us a mandate as to what you have to use, but they have specifically mentioned uh, designing a, uh, a system that allows you to consider prioritization, which means triaging. So, 
Um, we have, um, if you're interested in like a flow chart of kind of how that would look for your folks to, to do that, for the most part, I think this is, should come second nature to you because this is what you do all day long. But if you need something uh, that gives you a flow chart of how to triage uh, uh, folks in, in the event of an evacuation, we have a, a kind of a flow chart for that and we can provide that to you. Just uh, send Courtney or myself an email and we'll be happy to get that to you. So. Uh, staff responsibilities. So we talk a lot about nursing home incident command system. Um, that is a framework for these staff responsibilities. CMS is not requiring you to use incident command, um, but if you're in an area-wide disaster, that's what everyone else will be using, so we highly recommend it. Yeah, and in the language of the interpretive guidance, uh, they didn't say you have to use ICS, but they mention it a number of times. They refer to it a number of times. They say things like, like ICS, or when you determine your staff responsibilities, use a program like ICS, things like that. So certainly it's not a requirement, but all of these things that we're talking about here, I'm unaware of a program that would help you meet all of these that's similar to ICS. And, and like Courtney said, every single response agency in the United States, police, fire, sheriff, EMS, everybody uses ICS to manage an emergency event. So uh, ICS is set up on every single thing you see. So there's a reason why it's done. Uh, it can be incredibly useful in the event of a disaster or an emergency event. Um, and then we can talk about that uh, in a second. Um, so we have just updated our version of the nursing home incident command system. These are some screenshots of different roles that we have predefined. So for example, if you had an emergency, you had these uh, people already identified, you could pass them, pass these out and those people can go off and they have a, a to-do list and then you say, check back with me in two hours. Um, that's the kind of flow you can get from these ICS systems. Um, it really, it has the, the operational periods already outlined and it helps you document it as the incident unfolds. Yeah, and this is a prop, uh, uh, a plug for our nursing home incident command training in Los Angeles. Oh. We, we may be uh, almost um, full, so if you haven't registered for that, uh, do so on the, CAF website, but um, we'll talk about how uh, whether you, how you implement nursing home incident command and and uh, how it'll help you meet the new portions of the CMS rules. Yeah. So once you have your emergency preparedness program in place and you've um, enacted a lot of the things we've talked about, using NICS to do your exercises is a really great way to keep everything organized, and it kind of just sets it up for you, really. So. Um, continuing on to transportation. Sorry, we're kind of flying through this because we do have a lot to talk about. Um, this chart on the right-hand corner here, this is a form that we've developed. This would actually help you triage people as they're going out the door to get loaded up. This you could fill out every month to um, keep track of how many ambulances you might need to call or how many uh, wheel access vans. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, as a as a matter of best practice, our recommendation is, you know, our uh, population turns over regularly. So we would say that it's probably something you would want to address in your policy by saying maybe once a month you'll go through uh, your census and see if you had to evacuate this month, how many folks will need ALS transport? Um, if you're a subacute facility, you need to make sure uh, that you have, uh, have that addressed um, up front so that you can you can have those resources identified what you'll need and then it kind of go de goes down from there you know do you need a wheelchair van can they be moved in a car or a van or a bus do they need uh, an ambulance but it's only basic life support then you know kind of that that hierarchy of what your needs will be and have that at the handy because this is the information you'll need to share in the event of a disaster 
with uh, your EMS providers or your transportation providers with what your needs will be. Um, you know, like in the event of in Butte County, you know, uh, this was information that would have been helpful for the facilities to be able to relay that to the county officials responding in the event of a disaster. In the end, it was the county that took uh, control of the situation and said, I'm sending you these resources. Um, but that was only because we had one person from one county that was fantastic. The rest of the time, people were at a loss for how they were going to get these transportation resources. So it's important and it's a requirement now to have that pre-identified up front um, right. in your policies and procedures. So, Oh, yeah. I put a little pizzazz on that one. Okay. Uh, so next we have evacuation locations. So CMS is calling out that you need to be sending your residents to these pre-identified in-kind facilities. So wherever you're sending them needs to be able to provide the same level of care as uh, where you are evacuating from. So you need to go to a skilled nursing facility. You need, If you're from an ICF, you need to find an ICF. Um, I think only in like federally waived disasters could that not be the case, but that's very rare. That yeah, there uh, there are some some uh, you know caveats to that. And obviously, we know we can see from Hurricane Harvey or these large natural disasters where we get so many facilities evacuating that there's no way for us to find another skilled nursing bed for our resident. In those cases, they have to go to a way station or some uh, middle point before they end up at another skilled nursing facility, um, especially if you're doing something that's really time sensitive. So like the folks in San Diego in the fires in 2007, some of them had very little time to get out and they had to get out and they had to go to a general population shelter. But the rule states that they want you to pick evacuation locations prior to needing them. So having a, arrangements with other facilities uh, to uh, both send your folks to, but also receive folks from. Uh, pick locations that are both close to you and some that are outside of your area. Uh, think about how many people are in your census. Do you have uh, a 99 bed facility with uh, 85 to 90 people on it? Now, how many locations do you think you'll need to, to have secured if you need to evacuate? Uh, it's things like that you need to consider before evacuation, not as it occurs. And that has to be documented and written in that policy and procedure for evacuation. Right. And um, so that would be called a, a memorandum of understanding or agreement. And we have a slide on that later on, but that is there's a sample MOU in your uh, handouts. And so you can see those are some of the things you'll need to address maybe with your sister facilities and then thinking about partners maybe outside of your immediate area as well. Um, Jason made some good points. I just wanted to add CMS really wants you to find these facilities ahead of time because it does have implications for reimbursement if you're working with um, Medi Medicare. Yeah, and so um, Courtney talked about this, but this um, that third bullet point there, um, the reimbursement uh, will not be there if you send to your folks to another place. So um, not only that, it's the transportation cost of evacuating them. So um, there's a mechanism for having that covered uh, if you're transferring them to another skilled nursing facility. But if you're sending people to a general population shelter because you didn't uh, factor in that in your evacuation plans, you're not going to get reimbursement for those uh, transportation costs. So, right. um, and this is a, a slide. Hopefully, we all know this. Uh, we've learned uh, from that last event in Butte County, the Oroville spillway failure, that some people uh, still have in their plan to evacuate to a hospital. And under no certain circumstance should you be evacuating there unless they are the only way they can provide care for the resident you have. So if you have a, a subacute um, uh, in your facility and you have a multiple people on ventilators or really complex medical diagnosis uh, that there's no other subacute providers that can provide those services, in that instance, 
then it would be um, expected that you would evacuate to acute care if they have an opening. Uh, the problem is in these large events, we realize and we know that everybody is going to the hospital. So all of uh, all of the general public, that's where they're going. Um, those hospitals, they don't want to be taking residents from uh, low acuity residents from skilled nursing facilities. They want to be decompressing, if anything. If they, you know, they're going to look at folks that they have in their uh, in their services and say, listen, this person was going to get this charge tomorrow or the next day to a skilled nursing anyways, let's get them over there. Or this person's um, acuity is low enough that we can send them to a skilled nursing facility. So uh, expect them to be looking to decompress. Don't expect to send them to, um, uh, uh, to the acute care hospital because uh, there won't be a spot for them. So. Um, and then we mentioned this uh, kind of ad nauseum, but um, nearby facilities you want to have arrangements with out of the local area in case the area you're in is affected by an emergency or the, the event. So if you had, let's say, six facilities within a 10 square mile range, if they're all affected by the, the uh, emergency or disaster, you, you won't be able to rely on them to transfer your, uh, your residents to. So. Um, and then stopover points are what we talked about in the large event where um, where there's no place for them to go. They need to go to a point to get them out of harm's way until we can uh, identify a location for them. And that's generally something that you would not be responsible for determining. It would be the incident commander of the large event. So they, whoever that person is would, would decide, uh, you know, where folks would go and when they would go. So. Um, and then we need to make sure that the level of care is uh, applies across the board to all your residents. So, um, now, even though this survey procedure sounds really short, if you read the interpretive guide, and it's, it's a couple pages of some pretty dense text about what needs to go into the emergency plan uh, for um, evacuation. And we've talked about it. So hopefully you have all this stuff. Um, you know, if you have questions about it, just let us know after. Uh, the thing. And I'll have Courtney talk about the MOUs here. Uh, right. So I mentioned the MOUs slash MOAs. Uh, you see both out there. Um, so this is a, a non-legally binding document, but it would go into your emergency operations plan uh, to show that you have given some forethought to where you'd be sending your people. Um, if you have those like sister facilities or some kind of working arrangement, um, you would want to capture that in that sample policy that I attached as a handout. And so you can see in the sample policy here, um, they spell out relocation sites in the event of a disaster. Um, they talk about working with their local response authorities. And you'd want to refer back to maybe your, your all hazards approach here in case just to address the different kind of situations that you might need to evacuate for, like we saw that sample policy in the very beginning. So for creating a MOA or surge procedure, these are the, the things that you would need to address. And also, well, so these are some different step-by-step uh, -step things that you'd want to do in your procedure. And so that very first bullet point, um, I just want to be clear, we'll talk about this as it relates to your communication plan, but uh, it's important to have uh, a primary and alternate means of being able to communicate with each one of those uh, uh, different folks in there. So uh, if you're relying on um, using a different facility, have a primary and an alternate means of communicating with the administrator or the DON or whoever um, you can speak to it at the, the, the facility. Same thing with the EMS uh, and first responders, uh, regulatory agencies. What's a primary and alternate means of getting hold of them? Um, you know, bed capacity being assessed through uh, software systems. So many counties um, have electronic bed polling systems that they want you to use uh, to kind of pass that information along. Uh, in Los Angeles County, everybody should be on ReadyNet. If you're not on ReadyNet, you need to get on ReadyNet. Um, if you want to know how to get signed up for that, 
we will sign you up for it and we'll take you through the process. And it's free. And it's free. Uh, Los Angeles is one of the very few counties in California that will pay for you to be on ReadyNet. Um, and that applies to only skilled nursing providers. Intermediate care providers are not on that on that list yet, but um, uh, we'll bring that up to the folks in LA County. For Sacramento County, that's ReadyNet. Those, the county is paying for you to be on it. San Diego pays for you to be on it. Well, Santa Barbara does. So if you're not on those systems, you need to be on those systems. Uh, that'll help you meet the communication portion or one of the communication portions as well. So. Right. It's really, uh, it's really important to know what your county is doing, what system they're using, and what they expect from you. Um, if they're expecting you to send them all this information during a disaster and they, they can't really help you until they have contact with you. Um, so assessing bed capacity, um, your county might call you and ask for a bed pole in the event of a disaster. Um, if, they, if they're working with a hospital to discharge or decompress patients, these are all um, different things that could right. trigger this surge procedure for you. Yeah, and, and obviously, if you have folks that are within a day or two, uh, you know, leaving, you want to discharge them if they can. If you have families that can take uh, folks um, uh, home uh, rather than having to evacuate them, that's always a good practice as well. So, um, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about those. So this is what the um, surveyors will ask to see. They're going to ask to see copies of those. Uh, agreements or arrangements um, that we've been talking about. And they're going to ask uh, your administrator to explain how these arrangements will work uh, and how uh, you have arranged for transportation in the event of an evacuation. So it's, you know, this is going to be a deficiency if you're not able to relate to them the process you're going to use for transportation and the pre-identified locations uh, for these folks. So. Uh, Courtney's going to talk about shelter in place. Hopefully folks uh, have some um, experience with that, but um, now we need to put it in the term of a policy and procedure. So, so as we showed before, the uh, subsistence needs, the food and water and medical supplies requirement for evacuation also applies to shelter in place. But there's a few other things that you'll need to think about for subsistence. If you're planning to shelter in place and run off of your um, emergency generator, you'll need to think about how much diesel fuel you'll be needing uh, for however many days you're planning for and also like a safe way to store that. Uh, you'll need to address those. If you don't have your utilities, uh, you'll need to address those like sewage disposal and some of those other things that we talked about in evacuation. And if you go into the EOP template, we do have, um, oops, we have these appendices that you'll see a screenshot there um, that can give you a better idea of the things you'll need to think about. And like Jason mentioned, we are updating that and it should be ready in about a month or so. But um, yeah, and as far as the diesel fuel uh, uh, goes, it's not just making sure that you have enough. Uh, some people have natural gas, some people have the diesel generators, but having um, the storage uh, to ride out whatever pre-identified uh, amount of time that you have to shelter in place, but also uh, the means to uh, you know, get resupplied in the event that you have to stay longer than that. So, uh, so with the shelter in place, you can have, you know, a plan that says we're going to shelter in place for 72 hours. We're going to have food, waters, and supplies that last for that period of time. At the 48-hour mark, we may choose to contact our resupply vendors to bring us things. And if any point during that uh, remaining 24 hours we're not able to get resupplied, then we'll initiate our evacuation. So, uh, so you can have a plan in that um, in in your shelter-in-place uh, policy that says. You know, at some point during that event, you'll try to get resupplied. And then if you're not, then it would transition over to an evacuation. So. Right. And making some kind of uh, determination in the section where you talk about when you activate your EOP and deciding if you're going to shelter in place or evacuate or how those might come together. Um, that's something that would be a good thing to outline in your policy as well. At what point? 
would you what would trigger you having to evacuate instead of shelter in place or vice versa right and then who's going to make that call as well so right so the communication plans are um, pretty substantial when you read through them um, they need to include all of the following things. So you'll need a policy and procedure that dictates, uh, you know, when you use this uh, communication plan. But you need, at a minimum, the names and contact info for all staff. Uh, that's a primary and alternate means of communicating with them. Entities providing services. Uh, so if you're expecting to be resupplied by vendors, you need primary and alternate means of communicating with them. Uh, same thing with resident physicians, other long-term care facilities that you would have those agreements with. Uh, volunteers, we haven't talked a whole bunch about volunteers, but if you plan on using volunteers during an emergency event, um, then you need to have, um, if you're using them for a critical function, you need to make sure you have primary and alternate means of communicating with them. Um, Emergency response partners, this is a huge one. This is as important as anything else, uh, just as important as contacting your staff, is how do you get a hold of the people uh, that will be providing emergency response uh, in the event of an emergency or disaster? Um, obviously, we know 911 for something that's urgent or um, immediate. Uh, if you got a fire at your back door, then obviously 911. If you got a fire inside your building, 911, right? But if it's a large event where multiple providers or multiple uh, skilled nursing facilities are affected, uh, along with a large percentage of the general population, then who do you need to call? And, and how are you getting help to your building? You need to have that pre-identified in your communication plan. So uh, state enforcement agency, and for us, that's going to be the local district office. So how do you get a hold of them? How do you get a hold of the duty officer for CDPH um, or in Los Angeles County? How do you get a hold of the duty officer for licensing within the uh, Department of Public Health there? Uh, you also need to contact uh, information for the ombudsman and any other sources of assistance. So uh, it's pretty lengthy, uh, you know, all this stuff. So um, CMS is not indicated that you mandatory have to have a sat phone or you have to have a ham radio or you have to have something like that but they have said that what you need to do is you need to work with your local emergency responders to see what way they want you to communicate with them in the event of a disaster so does that does your county want you to communicate with them by sat phone do they want you to provide that information electronically through a bed polling system? What are what are those things? They all need to be pre-identified and part of your communication plan. So, uh, uh, it's it's important uh, to note that um, each county will have a different method of wanting you to uh, communicate with them in the event of a disaster. So I can't give you a hard and fast rule of what folks want you to do. Um, so. Uh, as well, in your communication plan, you need to have a pre-identified way of sharing information and medical documentation as necessary. So how can you provide the information that will uh, maintain that continuity of care when you're evacuating people? So uh, if you need to know what a, a sample face sheet looks like, uh, we have something in the EOP template. Um, there are a number of different free resources on the internet. Uh, if you have an uh, EHR system, chances are it has a, a pre-designed uh, uh, face sheet that you could uh, put in an envelope and send with the uh, resident when they get evacuated um, that gives, you know, the general condition uh, of the folks and stuff like that. Um, but it also talks about when their last meds were, what kind of medications they were on and stuff like that. Because remember, unless uh, unless you're you're not discharging these folks, you're only moving them transfer or, uh, temporarily. So, if you were discharging them, it'd be one thing. But um, you want to just maintain maintain that continuity of care, and uh, and these folks will hopefully come back to you fairly soon. So, um, you also need to have something in your communication plan that talks about sharing the general condition and location of where this resident gets evacuated to. Uh, uh, with their family and or the ombudsman's or whoever their representative is. Uh, that is permitted under HIPAA. It doesn't violate the HIPAA laws. 
Uh, so you need to make sure that's accommodated for um, uh, in your communications plan. So, uh, and then uh, you'll need to be able to relay your ability to provide assistance to your local jurisdiction in the emergency event. So it's not just you communicating with them to find a sp spot for your residents. It's you communicating with them to let them know how available you are to help in an emergency event. So it's not just a, a one-way street. Basically, you have to have an open channel of communication with those uh, local jurisdictions uh, where you can provide resources or occupancy needs uh, uh, for um, uh, folks coming into your building or whether you're evacuating. So that has to be in your plan. And um, did you want to say anything about discharging? Like in, if you're transferring your patients, you're not supposed to formally discharge them. CMS wants you to do like a 30-day temporary admission. Right. And that goes back to... Um, not only in the continuity of care, but the recovery phase of your own building. Um, if, if your patients get formally transferred to another building and they don't or don't want to come back to yours, um, you might not be getting the reimbursement and the revenue in order to continue operations. Yeah. And uh, we've seen buildings close down after significant emergency events because they just can't. Um, yeah. can't get their staff back in the building, their patient, their residents back in the building, all that stuff. Right. So we want you guys, if you're doing this, uh, we, we want to make sure that if you have to evacuate, you're not discharging these people. And if you're taking folks from a uh, facility, unless that facility tells you they're discharging them to you, then you're just doing a temporary admission. So, right. uh, And we have some guidance as to what that looks like. On the website, um, we're also uh, updating that portion of the template, right. the emergency operations plan template that will be in it when when we're done. So. Yeah, this is something you would really want to uh, be detailed and spell out in your policy for evacuation because um, the receiving facility might not know this and they might formally admit your patient and then um, uh, CMS has two records, two billing things going on for the same patient. It creates a huge headache as, as you could imagine. Yeah. And so uh, we talked about this uh, at the beginning, but you need to have a method of sharing that information with uh, residents, clients, and their families or representative. That's called out for in the requirement. And there's also a requirement to share your emergency operations plan with the families of the residents uh, prior, uh, you know, uh, upon admission. So uh, this would be a good time to collect or gather that information from the families and to share with them uh, that portion of your emergency operations plan uh, that, you know, this is how you would be contacting them in the event of an emergency or disaster. So, um, and then let's talk about just uh, what the surveyors were, will be looking for when they come in your building. So these will all be new uh, requirements. Uh, they're verified that all your contacts are included in plan and they need to be updated at a minimum annually. Although with staff turnover, depending on how much staff turnover you have at your facility, uh, hopefully you should be updating this concurrently with any other list you have for your staff. Uh, so periodically, it should be done uh, much more uh, than annually, I would think. So, um, And if you choose to use a satellite phone or a ham radio or some other method of communicating with uh, your uh, local uh, emergency response partners, they're going to want to see that equipment, and they're going to want to see you will probably work that equipment. Show me how it works. That's That would be my question if I was a surveyor. Okay, great. you got a sat phone. How does it work? How do you turn it on? Who do you call? Uh, and, and as long as you can answer probably fairly basic stuff, and that's really all it is with a sat phone is, most of the counties that use satellite phones have a quarterly drill and you call into number, just say, uh, here I am. And that's pretty much it. Uh, and then they, you know, in the event of an emergency or disaster, they'll man those phone lines in their community or their operations center. So uh, surveyors will verify that you have a method of sharing that medical documentation. We talked away about with other providers and family members or their representatives. Um, and then surveyors will um, verify you have a means of sharing your ability to provide assistance to the AHJ. And that, that AHJ is just an abbreviation for your local 
responders, whether that's the county or the city, most likely the county, um, in, in the event of a disaster, and how you're going to be able to provide them assistance, uh, and what method that your county um, requires you to provide that uh, that information. So, and then they're going to interview residents. Um, this is right out of the in, interpretive guidance. They're going to interview residents to see if they've been told about your emergency operations plan. So, uh, and they're verify they will verify that there is a policy and procedure uh, to do so. So, and um, in your handouts, there is a checklist to review your emergency operations plan. And so this is a good tool to see kind of create a baseline of where you're at. And then if you go into our template, if you don't want to use the entire template, you can just pull sections right out there. Um, and and add them to your own your own operations plan if you already have a template that you're familiar with um, and then we also have on there I think I already said the, the MOU that you would right. want to include in there as well so uh, we know that the information we've passed along in the last uh, three webinars is a whole bunch. And the more we read the interpretive guidance, the more we realize how large this this rule really is. It's, um, it's going to be uh, time consuming. Um, like I said before, it's not complex. It just takes a lot of time to do. There's a lot of things to consider uh, when you do this. Um, CAF is happy to help you uh, in any portion of the plan. Uh, if you have not um, gotten involved in your healthcare coalition, you, you know, start. We uh, have that contact information for you. You can just email us, and it'll also be up on our website, which is um, CAFDisasterPrep.com. Now, if you're in Los Angeles County, it's a little. It works a little bit differently. They don't have a central meeting because the county is so large. They have uh, what's called disaster resource centers. And so, if you're in Los Angeles County and you want to attend disaster resource center meetings, those are the coalition meetings for a general geographic area. Uh, you can contact us as to which one is uh, applicable for your facility. We'll help you out there. Just so you know, CAF has a representative that goes to all of those uh, those meetings, and we will have a countywide call uh, that will take all of the information that applies to skilled nursing facilities from those meetings, and we will give give you all of that information, along with survey procedures and stuff like that that will help you. That's for Los Angeles County uh, specifically. So right, and if you're in Sacramento County, we are doing a call down drill today, and you'll be getting a call from me later. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, webinar the part four of the webinar series. Now we've covered the rule, uh, but we've kind of gone light on what it's going to look like to go through the survey. So the part four will cover exactly what the surveyors are going to be asked. We'll mention, we'll, we'll talk about every single new uh, tags uh, that apply to intermediate care facilities and skilled nursing facilities. They're virtually identical. And, um, and we'll be doing that on September 26th, uh, which is a, a Tuesday from 10 to 11 Pacific time. Uh, if you've not registered, go ahead and register. Um, and that if at any point any of your staff need to watch this, um, by all means, all three will be up on YouTube uh, later on uh, today, maybe or tomorrow. We, we've got a, a drill later on today, so um, we'll, we'll get to your questions here now. So Right, yep. So September 26th, we're taking a three-week break because Jason is going on vacation. <laughs> He's going to get a front row seat to Hurricane Irma yep. over there. Yeah, okay. so, we've, um, so we've got... Uh, uh, first question is, when did your EOP checklist last get updated? It was updated in 2015, so mm -hmm. it was just a year before the rule came out. Uh, the emergency operations plan template was designed through a grant with Los Angeles County. So as you go through the uh, thing, if you're outside of Los Angeles County, you'll need to remove all reference to the county because uh, the surveyor is going to go, well, that's great, but it doesn't really apply to you because you're not in Los Angeles. But uh, if you're in Los Angeles, we have a lot of those uh, kind of resources pre-identified. So, um, And next question, is there any amount of surge from the community that we have to be prepared for? So uh, no, but it, does, it doesn't give you 
a mandate of what you need to be uh, prepared to search, but it does say that you need to have a plan to provide resources uh, to your local jurisdiction and a way to, uh, to communicate with them, both the primary and alternate means of communicating with them uh, of your ability. Um, but you need to have a plan to actually provide uh, a surge if somebody calls on you and you get to you get to determine what your uh, surge capacity is nobody says that's not enough um you know or anything like that and we didn't really go over it here but uh, a really big part of that is the 1135 waiver process where you can go above your bed capacity uh you know in the event of a large disaster so um, we have some guidance for that. We're working on something that incorporates this new rule into the emergency operations plan template, and we hope to have that done for you real soon. So. Great. Um, and somebody asked if we could send a handouts in Word. Uh, we certainly we certainly can do that. Uh, and um, I think um, we'll put the handouts on the CAP disaster prep website in both formats and that maybe that's a better way to get to folks rather than sending them to everybody twice so. yeah the template is in word but uh, and the checklists have fillable fields in them but the mou i can make a, a word document okay. for sure so we have another question from an icf provider um, can an icf evacuate to a sniff as one alternative and they certainly could but i don't think that would be um an appropriate level of care, but it would depend on the acuity of the ICF resident. If they're uh, ICF DDNs, if they they need nursing care, then of course, yes, that's an appropriate uh, location. If they're uh, DDHs, then probably not. But in those instances, we've seen licensing say that you can, um, you know, evacuate to, um, we've had uh, evacuations go to like a residence inn where they had, the method of providing the same level of care to the residents and all the staff went with them to, uh, you know, one of those residents in places with a, you know, kitchen and stuff all like that in there. Uh, uh, you know, a great person to ask is, uh, you know, we have a provider that had four, I think three or four facilities evacuate uh, this, this weekend from the Latuna fire. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, if you're an ICF provider and you have questions, as to how they work through that evacuation, because I think they did a great job. Give me a call, and I can put you guys in touch. So, uh, so, so s somebody uh, commented that Santa Barbara Co County does not yet have sniffs on ReadyNet, but hopefully soon they will have them on ReadyNet. Uh, um, so Napa County, I don't believe is on ReadyNet. I believe Napa County may use uh, EM systems, uh, but I'm not sure. I don't know each county's uh, uh, providers. The, the problem is there are multiple different um, uh, software, competing software companies that provide these services to counties. Uh, and each county, you know, goes out for bid and they pick it probably based on low bid. I don't know how they determine uh, what system they choose, uh, but each county is different. So uh, San, San Diego County did sign an MOU in 2009 uh, that is uh, still um, valid. So um, in San Diego County, you're the one county in California that has that agreement with every facility within the county. And to my knowledge, that's still good. And it would still work uh, in the event of a large uh, scale wildfire or uh, or uh, earthquake or something like that. So. Yeah, San Diego County's coalition is very active and they try really hard to include SNFs. So, um, yeah, it's, it's probably still solid. So we're, we're getting a lot of folks from uh, asking if they could join uh, uh, ReadyNet or, or their county's providers. Unfortunately, you'll have to contact your county health care coalition uh, um, or the hospital preparedness uh, program coordinator in that county. Uh, and those folks will be able to tell you whether they pay for skilled nursing facilities to be on ReadyNet or whether that's even the way that they want you to communicate with them in the event of a disaster. Um, they may have, they may say, we want you to just use a phone tree. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, unfortunately that's county dependent. There's no mandate to, so that they get to pick whatever is best that works best for them. So, um, 
I think if a sniff called them, though, they would be so happy to talk to you. And if you showed interest in getting a electronic system like that, um, putting that on their radar would would be a good start, honestly. Yeah, I we have a question here. So uh, somebody's saying they have a high turnout of patients. So great for you if you have a great uh, Medicare population. You're probably doing really well. Uh, the the reality is the rule makes no distinction for how long a resident stays in your facility. So uh, it does say that each resident needs to be trained or made aware of your emergency operations plan. I should, shouldn't say training because that's a misnomer. It's you need to make them aware of their emergency operations plan and how they would communicate and how you would communicate with their family or representatives if something were to happen. So. Um, and that's pretty clear. It doesn't, there's nothing in there that says if they're in there for a day or three days or a week uh, or 14 days, do you not have to do it? You'd have to do it with everybody. So uh, we have heard people of like putting a flyer in the admissions packet for the patient, the resident and families and having like a sign in sheet to say that they acknowledge that they saw that. Um, just mention, just realize that CMS specifically stated in the interpretive guidance that they will ask a random sampling of residents mm -hmm. whether they were notified. So um, hopefully they don't start with your memory care. Unit. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I think they would have some, uh, they, they would be understanding in that, in that part. So. Um, uh, so someone asked, does the sample EOP cover the requirements for policies and procedures and all requirements in the new rule? Well, I would say our procedures are probably pretty good. But the way we wrote our policies, one, I don't think it's robust enough, and two, uh, we didn't do it from an all-hazard sense. So we want to write an all-hazard policy that would apply for uh, most of the policies and procedures within the rule, and then put that at the front of the EOP template, and then refer to the procedures for specific uh, stuff. So. Uh, it doesn't cover everything in the rule. It's maybe 80% of the way there or 70% of the way there. Uh, but I think if, if you look at our EOP template and you say, okay, this is the framework I want to use, uh, you can certainly do that. And as we complete the policies and procedures, we can get those over to you. Um, my hope is Jocelyn and I are, are working on rewriting it. We should have it done we hope by the middle of October, but I want to tell everybody by the end of October, and then we'll we'll go from there. So. Right, and the reason why I attached it as a handout today, even though it's um, only like 80, 90 percent compliant with this new rule, is you're going to have to customize your policies so much anyway that you can still take what we have and add to it and make sure that it's addressing those hazards that you identified and um, addressing the specific things that you would want your staff to do. Like imagine if the administrator and none of the the lead staff is there, if a, if a regular CNA took this binder out, would they know what to do? And that is really the end goal besides just um, complying with the surveyors you right. want this to be an effective plan right and so uh, we had um, somebody ask a question that we keep mentioning ReadyNet and it's not free for ICFs and I want to make it clear that not every county will require you to provide them information through an electronic means, meaning ReadyNet or EM systems or uh, Image Trend. There are a number. There, I think there are three main ones. But the point is, the rule says that you need to have a method of communicating with your emergency response partners, your ability to to uh, receive patients or provide resources in the event of disaster. I'm just saying that in most counties, especially larger counties, they're requiring the skilled nursing facilities to provide that information through an electronic means. And that's certainly the, the uh, requirement in Los Angeles County. And it will get to that requirement in other counties as this progresses. But it doesn't mean every county is going to require an ICF to give them that information electronically. They may say, hey, well, you know, your resources needs and your needs to perform, uh, provide uh, um, services to us is probably minimal. So maybe we just want a phone call into our emergency operations center 
you know, to give us a status update and tell us if you have any beds available and that's it. And maybe that's the method they want you to communicate with them. So unfortunately, there's no hard and fast rule for e each county. You're going to have to ask the folks at your county how you want, how they want you to communicate with them, both when you need resources, but also when they need to get resources from you or they need to place uh, evacuating uh, folks in your facility. So, um, so we're sorry, we're just scrolling down to the next question here. Yeah. So a small bed ICF would need to evacuate to another small bed. ICF, and that's probably the goal. That's definitely what we would want you to do is to have those arrangements. When you got six beds, it's a little bit easier to pre-identify a multitude of spots, have an agreement set up, um, you know, with other providers. If you have sister facilities, if you're part of a chain and you've got a bunch of other facilities, you know, obviously they're going to be first on your list, but uh, only when it's okay for your residents and, and safe for your residents. Uh, don't drive them 50 miles away if somebody is 10 miles away and you can go there. So, um, uh, Search plan um, applies to ICF as well. Yes, it does. Um, do you have info on the 1135 waiver process on your website? Oh, that's from Donata. Hi, Donata. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, if it's not up, it will be up soon. Uh, we finished uh, the guidance on it, and we're going to add it to the OP, but we'll we'll do it as a, a set aside um, uh, thing as well. So, uh, and ReadyNet to um, Alameda County provide. Oh, so and Donata also let us know if you're in Alameda County, and I think there's 90 facilities in Alameda County. It's maybe not that many. There's a bunch. There's a lot. So if you're in Alameda County, listening to this, uh, ReadyNet is covered for uh, all long-term care facilities. So. Um, uh, Orange County does have ReadyNet. Whether they pay for folks uh, to do ReadyNet, I'm not certain. So uh, for an ICF six-bed facility, alternate energy requirements, uh, no generators are uh, present. Um, you could use an agreement with an outside company to provide a generator if you wanted to. Uh, you could purchase a, a, a temporary generator. You could, you know, like a little Honda generator or something like that. You could do that. It's not required. It just says that you need to have a plan to provide, uh, uh, you know, that safe kind of condition for your residents. Now, uh, ICF facilities don't have the same temperature requirements that skilled nursing facilities do. You know, for skilled nursing, we know here, 80, anything above 81 degrees uh, is considered unsafe for a skilled nursing resident. For intermediate care facilities, I'm not sure that's a requirement in Title 22. And now we're kind of working with a state requirement and a federal requirement. They're two different things. But uh, for the ICFs, you just need to make sure that you have a plan uh, to keep folks cool. Uh, maybe uh, that plan is, um, you know, uh, having ice, time. yeah, having them in a room that you can keep cool with with fans. Do you Can you get a portable air conditioner to make sure the room stays cool, uh, you know? If you if you lose water, um, you know, and you're not able to flush the toilet, you need to have a plan to, you know, be able to take care of that waste and stuff like that. But uh, don't worry. I, I think that would be – you certainly could sign a contract with somebody to have them come provide you a, a generator, and that would kind of take care of the whole thing. But I don't know that that's necessary. So uh, you can it can be done without an actual generator for an intermediate care facility. So. Um, Unfortunately, somebody asked if we could send a list of the counties that have ReadyNet. I'm not clear on all the facilities that have ReadyNet and, and which ones use other uh, types, um, but um, uh, you'll have to contact the county itself uh, for that information. And the surveyors for Los Angeles, somebody asked who will be the surveyors for uh, Los Angeles County. At this point, we don't know um, whether it will be a life safety surveyor or nursing surveyor. Um, the state is it looks like they're leaning towards having the the nursing surveyors do the the emergency preparedness um, uh, surveys. We just don't know for sure, um, but uh, they haven't gone through the training yet, and they will start doing the training very soon for their surveyors. So, um, and uh, that was the second question. And do we have any future trainings in Los Angeles County? Well, yes, we do. On Thursday, we'll be talking about the rule at the Los Angeles. Uh, county wrap session, we'll have, we'll have a table uh, set up 
Um, if you want to drop by and get some information on the emergency preparedness rule or uh, um, things that we have within the county uh, that are for Los Angeles County. And we'll also have the Nursing Home Incident Command training on October 11th in the city of Carson uh, at the Doubletree Hilton. You can register through our website and those. Uh, it's free to attend, five hours continuing education credits, and I believe we give you a, a lunch as well. So. And we're having a raffle. And we're having a raffle. So if you're in LA County, head over to CAF.org and click on their events tab and um, October 11th we have a, a free training yep 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 good stuff so we got one, uh, one more one more um, question here what if a patient who was transferred from another facility refuses to return to their area assuming where they came from is already deemed safe well, uh, I think you get to send them back because it's a temporary uh, relocation rather than uh, did, they weren't discharged from their other facility. So they're still a resident as long as they're within that 30 day window. So and uh, this goes back to having your your memorandum of understanding and your policy for surge and patient transfer and evacuation. Um, you need to have all of this spelled out about not formally discharging them, doing a 30 day um, temporary transfer. Uh, this is what we were talking about. If if the receiving facility formally admits them because they don't know that this is how CMS wants emergency transfer to be handled, you know, have these these two different records for the same patient. And also, uh, if you don't do the temporary transfer, that patient can decide to stay. If they like the new nursing home better, they can decide to stay there. And then, you know, that creates a headache. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, certainly that's up to you. I would say in your policy, you would want to say, that it's a temporary relocation for up to 30 days. They're going to come back um, uh, to, the, or they're going to go back to the facility. Uh, but certainly on a case by case basis, uh, you could speak to the other facility if they want to discharge them and you want to keep them, you could, you could probably arrange to do that. It's just that you wouldn't want to put that in a policy. You'd want to make sure you said that all residents are temporarily relocated to this and they go back as long as it's within 30 days. So someone asked to repeat the training information in Carson. That's October 11th um, at the Doubletree Hilton in Carson. Not great with the freeways down there. I think it's right off the 405, I think. Uh, it's right next to the Carson uh, Community Center uh, which is where our training will be uh, on Thursday. We'll be in Los Angeles on Thursday. Now, the training we're at at the Carson uh, Community Center in Los Angeles is a part of a larger full-day training. We're only doing one hour, and what we're covering is just a snapshot of uh, what we covered in these webinars. So if you've watched the webinars, uh, the content that we're going to provide you is going to be pretty basic in comparison to that. But we will have some... Uh, some uh, stuff um, that you can come by and get some tools and some tips and stuff like that at our, or if you just want to chat us up, we'll be at a table at the front of that. The so. wrap session at the Double Tree. Uh, well, it's at the Carson uh, Community Center, which is right next to that Double Tree Hilton in Carson. Okay, so just to be clear, we're going to be at the Carson Community Center on uh, the 7th, which is this week, and we'll be doing an hour presentation. We'll have a table if you want any more information. Is that for CAF members only, or is that open to everyone? It's open to everybody, open but to they everybody. gotta pay to get in there, so. Oh, okay, and then um, we mentioned another training in Carson that will be happening on October 11th, and that is at the Double Tree um, Hilton, which is- Right next door. Right next door. So just in case there's any confusion, we're talking about two separate events, but they're right next door to each other. Yeah, and the one in Carson is free, so. The, yeah, the training for the Nursing Home Incident Command is free, correct. All right, do we have any more questions, it I, looks like? I think we got to everybody. So hopefully uh, you guys uh, learned a lot. If you have questions, uh, um, you know, feel free to contact us. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure our... Um, our stuff is on that slide, but, um, you know, it's jbeldon at calf.org or Courtney or C. Kesterson at calf.org. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, just feel free to email either one of us. Uh, we'll be happy to help you. 
Uh, last time we got a couple hundred emails <laughs> afterwards, oh, yeah. so give us a, a little bit of time to respond to you, but we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly yes, can. Yes, I'm processing your, your evaluations as fast as possible. Thank you for your patience, and uh, we will see you in three weeks on the 26th of September. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody.